us about this special variety of corn and, and what it has always meant to uh, your tribe, the Catawba tribe. Oh, yeah. So uh, this is a, a beautiful variety of corn. Uh, it's a type of uh, flower corn. And unlike other tribes, we don't have stories about where the corn came from. So we know it came from trading with other tribes, right? And we know that Catawba's tried it and they thought it was delicious. And so they decided to start growing it. And in the act of growing it, whatever variety they had gotten, or in reality, varieties probably, they got from other tribes, they started growing. And over thousands of years, it became this um, just beautiful, resilient, vigorous variety of corn um, that has sustained our people all the way up until um, the termination era in the middle of the 1900s. Oh, right. And you said flower corn. What's the uh, flower corn? Yeah, so there's different kinds of corn. You know, there's like popcorn, and then there's uh, sweet corn, which is what most of the what most people in the grocery store think of. You know, that's what you see there. Um, and then there's flower corn, and so it's the flower corn that's turned into things like uh, masa, tortillas. Um, for us, traditionally, uh, couscous, so like cornbread, uh, ash cakes, those kinds of things. And what's amazing about it is, you know, sweet corn is delicious, but it's not super nutritious, right? A lot of it's not, a lot of the nutrition is not available to you. Um, but tribes across the country, all corn people um, in the Americas have these traditions of nixtamalization, right? So cooking it with ash or something very alkaline. And by doing that, it makes it really nutritious. And so um, that is the kind of corn variety we have is, is the kind that you use for that nixtamalization process. Got it. And, you know, we've done a whole show on nixtamalization. Um, if you're curious about that, you can go to our website, nativeamericacalling.com. In our archives, you can find um, episodes about corn. You can find ep an, ep an episode about nixtamalization. Um, it's a really fascinating process. I've done it before with some um, some uh, blue corn that I got from Hopi Nation, and it was, um, it was a really really cool process just the smell uh, uh, alone is just you know very magical <laughs> it's a it, I, I'd like to do that again I'd like to um, see about making some more tortillas it's a long process though to to do that but um, uh, so so what does this corn look like and have you have you cooked with it have you eaten it so far so uh I love what one of our tribal, one of our other tribal citizens called it. Uh, he called it the drag queen of corn. It's mm -hmm. got all of the colors you could imagine, everything from like pure white to um, so dark purple red that it's almost black. Um, my favorite are these kernels that are kind of lightish yellow, but they have these beautiful peach streaks on it. So it, it's just this beautiful corn, which makes it, very easy for me to get people on board with it uh, when I go and talk to people outside the community. Because, of course, the community is totally on board with it. Um, mm -hmm. Because it's just like, look at this corn. Like, feel it. it you, you're in love with it immediately. Um, and then the other unique thing about it is that it grows incredibly tall. Um, we're doing uh, our natural resources department, which oversees our agricultural work, is actually doing a growing experiment with Davidson College, which is about an hour north of our reservation. Um, and so in their greenhouse, they're testing precipitation to see, like, how long, uh, how much water the, the corn needs and also uh, what, how it might fare in this kind of shifting climate using different climate models. Uh, and so they keep sending us pictures, and the corn has not even totally set flower yet, but it is um, taller than I am. <laughs> um, and so this will be the third year that we've grown it since we brought it back to the community. Okay. And how tall are you? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> I'm very tall. I'm six foot one. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, that's a that's a big uh, that's a tall uh, stock of corn there. Um, if if you want to join our conversation uh, right now on the menu on Native America Calling, give us a call. Tell us about your corn. Tell us about your traditional corn and how it's kind of moved around your Native community. We're at one eight hundred nine nine six two eight four eight. That's also one eight hundred nine nine Native. If if you want to see a, a picture of 
of this uh, Catawba corn that Rue is talking about. It's on our website, Native America Calling, uh, dot com, connected to this episode here. Um, so, so Rue, let's go back just a little bit um, and t- uh, tell us how this corn got um, maybe separated, if that's the right word, uh, separated from the community. Yeah, absolutely. I What's kind of amazing about it is, you know, a, a lot of what I do is teaching um, both people in our community and outside our community about different federal policies and how um, tribes you survived um, different policies and acts by federal, state, and local governments. And so what's kind of amazing about this corn is that it's a really um, – it's a it's really exemplary of of that kind of history and what i mean is that this corn stayed with our community through um the 1700s which was the period in which uh there was massive settler encroachment ever since then we've been completely surrounded by um by non catabas um in the 1800s when south carolina made an illegal treaty with us the corn still stayed with us people were able to keep it um with us but it wasn't until the era of termination in the 1950s um, that we finally saw the corn and the people getting separated. And that's because as part of termination, when the federal government comes in and says, in our eyes, you are no longer a tribe, um, what they do is they uh, parse out the land, they cut it up and allot it, right? Mm-hmm. And we know that that policy has been used in other tribal nations um, over and over again. And so in separating out the land and telling people, oh, if you sell it, you'll be able to feed your family, you'll be able to afford running water, those kinds of things, um, our, our land base reduced. It was also a period in which Catawbas were first allowed to go into public schools and also a period in which Catawbas were really first allowed to go into the workforce. Um, Rock Hill was a big mill town. And so with all of those new pressures on Catawbas to be able to feed themselves, because you need money um, to feed yourself in, in this economy here, um, that the, the ability to nurture the corn um, went away and went away until the 1990s, so within my lifetime, when the last uh, corn was being grown, uh, Catawba corn. So skip forward to 2018, and that's when um, we finally got the, the wheels turning on rematriating the corn. Yeah, how did, how did you get your hands on um, on seeds? Yeah, so I I returned to my community in 2017 um, to work on language and quickly realized I couldn't learn the language unless I learned the land because most of the words were about um, the land that we occupy, right? That we live on and care. And so um, then my my aunt slash my boss at that time uh, said, "Okay, great. Well, the year you're in charge of these 40 garden boxes." And so I had to learn about food sovereignty very quickly and, and all that stuff. Um, and so we got together people who were already working on it in our community, you know, our clinic, um, our wellness department, our uh, now our natural resources department. And the thing, and I went and talked to the elders and said, what do you remember eating when you were a kid? How did your parents cook? All these things. And the thing that people kept saying over and over again to us was, we need to bring back the corn. We need to bring back the corn. And so I'd heard about this guy at the University of South Carolina named Dr. David Shield, uh, who is not at all in agriculture. His area of study is uh, Broadway. <laughs> and I said, hey, I heard you're good at finding, um, you know, these seed varieties, these uh, heritage seed varieties. Um, do you, have you heard of this? And he says, I'll look into it. And I was like, uh, whatever, he's not going to look into it. Uh, but three months later, he gets back to me and he says, oh, I think I found it. And so the North Carolina Extension Office was growing out some of their heritage seed varieties um, to just test them out and then, you know, bulk up the seed that they had. And so they were doing kind of an explanation of it. And when he saw the corn, he saw that it had the same number of rows as the cobs that we find in our archaeological sites going back thousands of years. Um, he, he saw that it matched the same kind of historical descriptions that we have of the corn. And then when you look at the story of how North Carolina Extension Office got it, they got it from this family, the Leal family in Hickory, North Carolina. And when they gave it to the North Carolina Extension Office, they said, we got it from the Indians. And we were the only Indians in that area at that time. So we feel pretty confident that this is a relative of the last corn that was grown um, in Catawba 